let's start this way. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah, we yeah. had the New York Times story that came out almost yeah. four years ago, and so much has changed with the topic since then. You've been involved with it for a long time as an observer. Give me your general sense of where we are now, because um, there are exciting developments on multiple fronts. I worry that it becomes UFO, UAP overload for the public, but give me, give me your sense of where we are now. Well, actually, the one thing I would probably not agree with is that it's overload for the public because the public I talk to doesn't seem to be that aware of it. Uh, I have to sort of bring people up to speed and and tell them what's going on. Um, But in general, I think you'd have to be a crank yourself to not believe that four years later we've made progress. There is more progress. There is more general acceptance. And there are more people who are talking about it in a serious, legitimate way. Um, I don't know that that means we're eminently uh, uh, in, in, in uh, standing at the door of a, of a big shift. Maybe we are. Um, but I feel like a big shift has already happened in that, you know, both you and, and myself have, have been involved in this for a number of years. And I've never seen it at this point where there's more things that are sort of breaking in a in a more public and uh, non uh, ufological way where they the mainstream media seems to be covering it. People are writing articles. There's a lot more going on. So yeah, I think things are changing a little bit. I really do. We saw some pretty amazing things over the last week and a half or so. One that jumps out at me is Senator Gillibrand of New York right. has proposed an amendment to some other pretty amazing proposed legislation. Can you talk about that? When you read that, what were your first reaction to it was? I, I, my first reaction when I read about the Gillibrand Amendment was that it felt like a Blue Book 2.0, but with a, with some teeth in it, uh, if they passed it as, as was and, and as written. So I, I, I think it's a positive thing. Uh, clearly, it was a positive thing when they put the last 180-day clock in that got us the uh, UAP uh, task force report. And I think uh, this this will be a good thing if it passes anywhere close to the, the way the amendment is currently drafted. Um I look at it as a as a super positive. Uh, I, I don't want to look to the government for all the answers because the government has historically kept us from a lot of these answers. So I can't get 100 percent excited about the government doing it. But I think what it does is it kind of unleashes some other powers that are out there. Uh, but first reaction, very, very positive uh, thinking it's it's about damn time. And uh, if it if it is passed in anything that references what is written, a good thing. I mean, one of the things they're talking about doing is actively going out and and looking into cases and then filing reports. Well, that does sound a little bit like Blue Book, but it sounds a little more serious. It sounds more authentic. Um, And also, you know, talking about do we have technological materials and and have people been made ill by uh, exposure to UAP? It's just, uh, I mean, the box has been opened and, and things are coming out of it. It sounds to me like the senator or someone on her staff has been doing a lot of breeding because this goes way beyond the other proposed legislation that seems to have bipartisan support. Let's establish something, a successor to the UAP task force, a permanent program. That by itself is amazing. But it really was looking at sensor data, military encounters, similar to what ATIP supposedly do. This Gillibrand is talking about something closer to OSAP looking at yeah. human effects and follow the evidence where it leads, which is astonishing. And it, not only is it astonishing, but I th- what was astonishing to me to go back to the, what my first think was Senator Gillibrand, what's up with that? I mean, I, I had not been given a, a hint that she was involved or might be involved in this kind of world. So uh, that gives me hope too. It means that there are senators out there who have been exposed to certain briefings who have paid attention and, and are are behaving in a way that is appropriate to some of the information they're getting. Um, but yes, it does seem more serious. I, I get a little lost to this day, and I admit uh, I admit it, and, and I think I'm one of the more informed people out there, but I still get mixed up on OSAP and ATIP. And, and, and I noticed that even in the Gillibrand Amendment, we're going to create a couple more uh, acronyms <laughs> that will confuse us all. I, I, you know, uh, I was thinking of just writing an article, frankly, that told everybody what each acronym stands for, because uh, everybody needs a cheat sheet these days. Back when it was Blue Book, you could at least go, well, that's what Blue Book said. Now it's like, I don't know, it's a little more, it's a little more challenging. 
Yeah, I've done some of that uh, in public presentations where I explain OSAP versus ATIP, TSA, BAS, uh, the various uh, competing uh, acronyms. Tic Tac, though, it's not an acronym, but you can throw it in there as a term that is not familiar to the general public. It seems to me that, you know, there's bipartisan support for something, some kind of an office to have a permanent investigation, even if it's just looking at military encounters. That's a major step forward. At least I hope it would be. Do you agree? I do agree. And also, uh, let's face it, Congress is full of uh, ambitious politicians. Uh, Who's been the most uh, probably outspoken on this issue is Marco Rubio, of all people. And and let's face it, he ran for president. He's an ambitious politician. He doesn't think talking about uh, UAP is going to kill his career. Uh, He may, in fact, think that you can actually run on UAP because it's sort of a threat analysis situation. Uh, uh, Mitt Romney, uh, extremely outspoken on it. People are sort of poking their heads out and talking about it. And they're using the cover right now, I think, of of trying to say, well, you know, it could be anything. I just, you know, but we know they're real and we want to make sure it's not our adversaries uh, because that would be a bad thing. But I keep saying if if they're real, if they're not made in America, if they're not made by China or Russia, then frankly, you don't have to be a high level math student to do the math on that one. It's, you know, some kind of exotic technology that we haven't been privy to knowing about. You uh, you wrote a couple of weeks ago, uh, your reactions to Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, the, the right. book that came out. In the end of that book, there is a very detailed proposal for a program That sounds remarkably similar to what the senator from New York is now proposing. It's very similar to what OSAP was, meaning essentially you follow the evidence where it leads. You don't just look at things in the sky. You don't just look at radar or sonar sensor information. You follow the evidence where it leads, which leads to people, human effects, interactions with these phenomena, whatever they are, and often very deleterious uh, effects, health effects. Give me your sense of uh, what you learned from that book and whether you think that somebody at at, uh, the senator's office has been reading it. Well, I think it has been read. And by the way, congratulations on the book. It it broke a lot of ground, a lot of news. Uh, And if if anything, I think it does show you uh, all the acronyms that you had to like wade your way through to even write that book uh, is actually the flip side, the positive side to it is it means, you know, you don't create an acronym out of nothing. It's usually for some kind of official reason. So there were a lot of people looking into it. I think it has been read. And I count myself to be one of the lucky people who sat down uh, with lunch uh, to, to lunch with you a few years back. And we I think our conversation turned to that very thing. It's like, OK, you you start to you know, I'm a former inve- I guess I guess you're all once an investigative reporter, you, you get to claim that. So I've been that you are that currently. Um, but you, you follow the facts. You start to, you don't have, even if you have a preconceived notion, you still have to have, keep your mind open to the idea that you may not have it right and you got to be able to get off your position. So um, what has happened over the years clearly is that we've gone from UFO, unidentified flying object, which means let's just look up in the sky and see what's out there, which was weird enough if it wasn't ours. But now following the facts, you start to see there are effects to those things. And as you point out in the Skinwalker book, uh, it, it it's not just things flying around. It's things that are happening around us. And uh, clearly, uh, someday Skinwalkers at the Pentagon is going to be looked at as a book that sort of brings these two worlds together and, and raises the question for all of us. And we're about to learn, I think. Um, I hope in my lifetime, officially, um, that that there's a big connection to this and that there's um, the world is stranger than we have imagined. And we're going to have to uh, open our minds up a little bit and, and try to get our brains involved with trying to think about what is really going on. So this time next year, there might be a permanent program approved yeah. by Congress, funded. It's, it's starting an investigation, maybe starting from scratch, hopefully building on research that's already been done. But a grand new adventure, a new level of uh, public interest in this topic. Do you think that a program like that, studying military encounters, nuts and bolts, flying saucers, radar, et cetera, talking to pilots, can solve this mystery? Or do you worry that maybe it's going to always be out of our reach? Well, I I actually, my, my feeling on that is, 
either we've already semi sort of solved the mystery and we're not telling everybody, you know, we're not sharing our work, if you will, uh, at the highest levels or at least with the public right now, or the mystery isn't that easily solved. Because uh, the, the only problem I have with the, the, the current run to do this formal investigation is we've been there before with Blue Book, uh, of course, and now it looks like we're going to be more serious about it. But there's just so much to know. And and it is important for us to track these things down. But but again, we have to not just only look through the windshield at the road ahead. We got to turn around and look in that rearview mirror and say, this has been getting studied for 75 years, at least at minimum since for 75 years, because you and I have read, you know, FOIA released documents on it. So I, I just still say it, it's all great. I'm in, I'm in favor of it. I hope this all moves forward uh, in a powerful way. But I would like the work shared more diligently for what has gone before. There were there are lots of people who are not with us anymore who devoted their lives to studying this. In, in government and out of government. And I think it would be nice if what comes out of this is we start to bring the whole big picture together. You know, as you mentioned, 75 plus years of, uh, of interest in the subject, but, but not much transparency. And we have seen documents squeezed out of the military through FOIA that were never meant to see the light of day in which the military officials at the highest levels are saying, this is real. It's not yeah. fictitious or imaginary. We need to get in, look into this because it could be considered a threat. I mean, that's where we were 75 years ago. And in a sense, it's where we are now. It is where we are now. But what I think is wonderful, the difference now is if you're if you're literally compelling the military to to own up and share their data, there's a lot more data. And the data that we have uh, is clearly uh, of, of a better quality. I mean, our sensors are good enough to tell us if we're being attacked, uh, you know, by a weapon from somebody, uh, you know, a nuclear weapon coming over the poles. Our, our sensors are really good and they're picking up stuff uh, that, that hasn't been picked up historically. And, and obviously those, those sensors aren't just uh, spread around the earth. They're on each aircraft. We, we have literally thousands of ways to gather data about UAP and, one of the exciting things about the Gillibrand Amendment or whatever comes out of it and, and what comes out of the, the, the June 25th report earlier is a sense that we have to start sharing this data, that we can't make the same mistake we made with terrorism, where everybody had it siloed into their respective organizations. And it took 9-11 for us all to come together and start sharing that data. I think we're going to start sharing UAP data right now. Some groups will be more forthcoming than others. Obviously, for example, it doesn't take a, a, a brain surgeon to figure this out. The Navy has been a lot more open to talking about it than the Air Force. And I would like to know why. Yeah, you know, I, I hope the next step after these things is people like Gillibrand or, or the Senate Intel Committee start hauling Air Force people in and saying, why didn't you cooperate? You know, what is your uh, assessment? Where Where is your information? So I think we need a few good senators and Congress people to kick the can here and, and uh, find out what's underneath. Yeah, you, you notice at the end of that, that UAP task force report, we saw some language about the Air Force that they are now going to establish some, some uh, listening posts where they can check out and look specifically look for uh, these unidentified it's UAPs, call them whatever you want. But it's the sense I get is they had to be dragged kicking and screaming to even get that far, that they yes. are, are not all that interested in transparency or on the surface, at least not that interested in the topic. And it suggests to me, as as we covered in the Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, there are forces out there that are are going to fight this every step of the way. You know, there you read between the lines in the book, the guys from OSAP went to, to knock right. at the door of where they think the goodies are hidden. And they got told to go away and the door was slammed in their face. Um, someone somewhere out there has a lot more information and maybe even yeah. physical evidence. And uh, I think as we get closer, they're going to put up even more of a fight. You know, George, we're also going to need another acronym. I hate to be the guy that say it, but UFO wasn't quite it. But neither is UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena. It's part of it. But what about these things in the ocean? You know, that's not aerial phenomena. Uh, what about the things that you and your uh, your um, 
fellow investigators discovered at Skinwalker and what's going on at Skinwalker. Not always aerial phenomena, other kinds of phenomena. Uh, I, I do believe that there will come a time when we look back at these days and we realize uh, that we were kind of naive and that the, the real answer is the universe is not only stranger than we imagine, but possibly stranger than we can imagine. And that, that when even our, and that even our smartest minds someday are still going to say, this is my best guess. Not sure. You know, we're not quite there yet. It's going to take a while. I've heard some feedback from people whose opinions I value, uh, who have been involved in lobbying Congress behind the scenes to try to get them to be interested in this and take a fair look at it. They are concerned about woo, about uh, exactly the kind of phenomena that the Gillibrand Amendment would would uh, would involve. Uh, because you know, there's one thing to study nuts and bolts saucers in the sky, things that can be picked up on sensors, things that appear over military installations a really good sure. solid reason to pursue that. Right. But there's all this other stuff on the outside that comes along for the ride, whether you like it or not. And there's concern that if we do look at the broad picture, like the Gillibrand Amendment would do, at things like Skinwalker, at, at uh, poltergeist type things that pop up, at cattle mutilations, that it endangers the whole process, that no one's going to approve public money to study something like that, even though it's part of the story, whether we like it or not. I don't I don't uh, buy that. I think, uh, you know, you're talking about the woo factor that where people are like, wow, I was up for talking about it when we were talking about physical craft flying around. But now you've you've lost me because you're going. I, I just think that the horse is out of the barn on this thing. All right. We've acknowledged to ourselves officially that these things are real. Now we have an obligation to look into what that means. And if the search for what that means leads to having to accept a little woo in our lives, then then that then I'm sorry, a tough break uh, for the people that find that to be too challenging. Uh, ultimately, uh, they may slow things down at the beginning because, I, I, you know, listen, I've got I've got I've got a new class of friend right now. And I think this bears on your question. The new class of friend is the they used to treat me like the drunk uncle at the wedding, right? That, okay, there's Bryce talking about UFOs. And then uh, I, I don't get that as much anymore. I get that more from people who, I, now I get from people, tell me what you know, right? But there's a new class of friend that actually knows a little bit about it and says, I just, uh, you know, I just, um, boy, I just don't want to think about it. Okay. Well, it, it, so if that's a, a new class that's being created, yes, you're right, George, there will be people in Congress who fall into that category. And there'll be people, Congress is still a reflection of us, bad as that is. Uh, and some of the people will be nuts and bolts people, and some will be woo people, and some people will be, uh, don't talk to me about that people. I, I remember in studying the early days of ufology, those guys like Kehoe and others are, are fine with studying flying saucers, but they were reluctant to say there might be somebody in those flying saucers zipping around, that there might be aliens in there. And then years later, they're very reluctant. These are UFO people reluctant to say those aliens in the craft are inter interacting with us, maybe abducting us. I mean, it's been tough to even drag ufologists along on this trip. It has. It's been a it's been a, a continual struggle. Uh, and if you think about it, here's what I think the evolution we're going to see over the next 10 years. Um, right now, we're in a, a period where the way to discuss this seems to be, at least officially, is we need to understand. We know these things are real, but we need to understand what's behind them. And, and, and implied in that is it might be us. You know, they may be made in America or made by our adversaries. We've got to rule that out. Over the next few years, we are going to rule that out, all right? And at that point, the conversation, it will be a different conversation. That conversation is going to be about, well, uh, they're here, they're, they're not us, uh, what are our theories? And that's where I want to get our best minds out there. Instead of going, well, is it China or is it Russia or is it us? Instead, they're going to say, is it ET? Is it? dimensional? Is it time? Is it, uh, you know, I, and I don't, I don't have a horse in that race right now. And I don't think you do either. We would just like 
the best minds, instead of pretending it's not happening, to acknowledge it is, and then try to decide what it might be and to help us as a society. And I'll tell you just one thing that I've always believed that I think is going to bear on this. And that is simply, it's a simple statement, but all of us together are smarter than any one of us. All right. So until we start looking at this as a large group Uh, the entire society looking at it, marshalling our best minds, our best information, our best data. We won't get the best theories and the best answers. So what's going to be good about the next few years is we're going to usher in a new period of seriousness. And um, that's good. Last week, there was another event that got a lot of attention uh, on the international stage. There was an event in Washington uh, where the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, was there for the conversation. Jeff Bezos, uh, one of the richest men in the world, uh, Abby Loeb, astronomy professor at Harvard, um, talking about uh, walking right up to the edge of talking about extraterrestrials. And I, I don't think there's anything particularly newsworthy that came out of that, other than you know it seems like Jeff Bezos doesn't really know what he's talking about when it comes to the subject. But the fact that it happened at all, and that people of that caliber, of that stature, were willing to discuss it to an extent, it, it speaks volumes about our times now. Yeah, I, I listen, um, I'm happy like you are that it happened. Uh, I was not a fan of it. I didn't think it was well done. Um, I, I had to tear my fists out of the ceiling a few times. I thought that uh, David Ignatius failed as a journalist and showed absolutely no intellectual curiosity about what, what he was involved in. He seemed to phone it in, and I was upset with him. Um, I do think the two first people are, are brilliant people. Uh, Averill Haynes, uh, the uh, director of national intelligence, is definitely somebody you should put on a show for three hours and drill deep and ask her what she knows. David Ignatius could care less. Um, and I'll tell you, the, the new star in my universe is, um, you know, is the head of NASA. Uh, because you know, Bill Nelson, uh, a former astronaut, former senator, is the only person actually willing to say, well, it might be ET. Yeah. You know, I'm willing to consider that. I'm willing to look into it. Um, as for the rest of it, um, listen, Jeff Bezos, I've, I've met Jeff Bezos, nice man. Um, I'm glad he's doing what he's doing, uh, you know, bringing people up into space. Uh, I think he's either ill-informed or is one of those people that does it doesn't suit his version of reality to talk about that these might be real because he's more about building ships to get us into space, not to find people coming here. Same with, uh, you know, Avi. Uh, uh, Avi writes for my uh, Trail of the Saucers publication. I'm glad to have him. Uh, But he just tiptoes up to it. And again, I don't know if pointing, you know, uh, telescopes at the sky is going to be the big thing. Uh, I, 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 I tend to think it probably won't. But especially since we have evidence that they're here in our, in our own skies, I think we should be pointing more around that. So that's kind of my take. Um, So I was disappointed. It could have been so much more. And I look forward to uh, a time when we put those kind of people on with a journalist like yourself, frankly, or, or whoever the networks have, who's really informed on the topic and is a dog with a bone. You know, I remember Tim Russert uh, on, on meet the press, Tim Russert would ask a question. And if somebody didn't answer it, he'd ask it again. And if they still didn't answer it, he'd go, I'm sorry, but I've asked this question twice. I'm going to ask it again. We'll be here all night if this continues. We need some of those people. Well, again, I I had the same sort of reaction. I was disappointed with the actual content, but uh, I found it encouraging that people of that stature would be on that stage and be willing to talk about it to some extent. And maybe it sets the stage for the next round, uh, another round. Um, let me ask you about you. So you've been involved in the topic as a writer and right. reporter for a long time. What's going on with you in the entertainment uh, sphere? Um, I hear rumors about all kinds of projects and pitches and yeah. ideas. And so what do you got going and what do you hear about the larger universe of, of entertainment with regard to this topic? Listen, I think in the entertainment business, a lot of people are interested in this. They read the news like everybody else. But a lot of entertainment people... I. What I am frustrated about personally is that I keep running into people who, who go, yeah, I heard about that. And their best way to deal with it would be like Apple TV's invasion, right? So in other words, you watch Apple TV's invasion and it looks like the only time anybody ever thought about aliens is when they invaded. 
You know, there's no sense that there was a history or there were UFOs or any of that stuff. So if you ask me what I'm up to and what I'm building on, on my board here and things I'm taking out, I'm trying to be the guy that, uh, at least in the entertainment product, is writing the stuff that is, is detail-based, that could, that, it, that, that yeah, still a, a hugely entertaining thing, but that lives in the real world. So for example, uh, one of my current projects is I've written a one hour drama pilot called UAP, um, which is very ground-based, accurate, but then sort of going out from there. It's kind of, I don't know, House of Cards meets Aliens, I guess, in its own way. And uh, yeah, I'll make a little news here. Uh, we just uh, brought uh, Christopher Mellon on as our consultant, uh, uh, you know, to help us set up this script. And he would be sort of our Lawrence O'Donnell, if you will. Uh, Lawrence O'Donnell famously uh, was on West Wing in the first season. Uh, so, you know, I'm very proud to have uh, Chris Mellon doing that. That's a good thing. And um, I'm finding a lot of interest. I mean, I'll tell you one thing, you know, uh, I'm not a huge believer in metrics and all that, but I do have this publication on Medium, Trail of the Saucers, and it's just skyrocketing. I mean, the, every, every day you get more views than you did the day before. Every month is better than the last month. Uh, it, it's just one of those things where uh, if you build it, they will come. And why are they coming? It's not that I'm, you know, the numbers don't matter to me, but why are they coming? They're coming because people are hungry to have this discussion in a serious way. So if you ask me what I'm up to, I want to tell stories that are based in truth. I have a, a feature film uh, based on the Roswell investigation. Um, I have a, another series I'm taking out based on the Betty and Barney Hill case, based on a book I've optioned, things like that. But it's very hard. I'm not going to say I'm out there selling every other day because most of the time when I go to some place, it turns out they've already got their own project, <laughs> right? And they'll say, "What a script, man! That thing really... Oh well, boy, fantastic!" Um, yeah, but we're doing something similar. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's good. I mean, one more question about your yeah. ventures: Dark Skies, terrific yeah. series. Thank you. A lot yeah. of people now, you know, the modern audience may not know about it. Is there a chance that that comes back in some form? It could, but you know what? That was my dream for years. This was a late 90s uh, sci-fi hour drama on NBC that uh, basically told the story of, of an invasion, but it was told uh, against the backdrop of the 1960s. So it's become kind of a cult hit over the years. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very proud of it, uh, extremely proud of it. But I felt uh, after we did 20 hours, it was canceled. So I always felt like I didn't get to finish telling the story and I would do anything to continue to tell that story, including rebooting it, doing anything to do it. Um, I've had to kind of give that dream up a little bit because it turns out, you know, that I don't own it. I mean, that's what it, it, this isn't like Britain where they have different copyright laws here. In order for me to write my idea, Dark Skies, I had to basically sell the copyright to Sony to do it. So Sony owns Dark Skies. So whether it ever gets rebooted or not isn't up to me. If it was up to me, I'd have rebooted it two decades ago. But uh, but it's, it's not up to me. So what I'm concentrating on instead is to say, you know, it doesn't do me any good to follow my dream of bringing that particular thing back because I can't do it by myself. But what I can do is create new original material. And I'm still the same writer I was that did that. So I just try to say, uh, what can I do that that uh, is better for the conversation? And frankly, I think UAP is the best thing I've, I've written on this topic ever, uh, because it's so current. It's just so, it's something I couldn't do on Dark Skies right now. Because uh, Dark Skies actually took a position. This is what's going on. And UAP is about people who are empowered in our own national government and still don't know what's happening. Right. And how they're they're kind of fumbling their way toward an answer, which I think is what's going on in our government right now. Well, I am a fan of Dark Skies. Thank uh, you. I have it at home. I, I'm also a fan of X-Files, of course. And, the, the, you know, that show came back for two last seasons yeah. and I loved it. Uh, yeah, but yeah. the public didn't. And I wonder if it did, it failed because the real world has gone beyond what the X-Files uh, would propose to examine in a fictional sense. I think that's true. Uh, I, 
I agree 100% with that. For, uh, first of all, I can't, for me to criticize the X-Files is a little uh, persnickety on my part because we were on at the same time. I, I love X-Files like, uh, like a lot of people and I enjoyed what it did. But if you'll recall, X-Files was never all in on UFOs. It, it, it basically did a UFO episode every so often. And they had to create what they called their mythology, right? So their mythology, I wouldn't say it got calcified, but it got codified, if you will, from season to season to season. So by the time you were watching those last two seasons that they put on most recently, it was hard to pivot to bring their mythology in to what is going on. And uh, that's always going to be a problem with trying to bring something from the past to life again, although Hollywood loves to do that. Um, but let's face it, this story is big enough, crazy enough, um, that there's, there's room to talk about a lot of things. And I just have one weird thing that I'll throw out there, which is the first thing I ever wrote was something called official denial and uh, not the first thing I ever wrote, but the, the, with the first UFO piece I wrote, it was a two hour film. Uh, it was on the sci-fi channel, their first original film. And, um, you know, one of the things I posited was that they weren't aliens. They were us from the future. And now, of course, that seems to be a theory everybody's talking about. Yes. Yes. And I remember writing it in 1988 and showing it to a few people. And they're like, what have you been smoking, man? Because that just sounds pretty crazy. But now people are willing because I think we all know that something's happening here. And as the song goes, what it is ain't exactly clear. And so we are wide open right now to trying to think about and to puzzle through this mystery together, which is why I've enjoyed uh, knowing you and, and, and your work so much, because we're both kind of, there's a lot of people currently, it's dark out there and we're fumbling around trying to shine a flashlight here and there because we want to get a picture of where we are. But all we ever get at one point is just that that one illuminated area, maybe that's a little of Area 51. Oh, well, here's this witness. And I, one of my favorite essays I ever wrote was, how do we reconcile all this? And, and that's what I think, to circle back to where we started this thing, you got UFOs, you got Skinwalker Ranch, you got things in the water, you got crop circles, you got animal mutilations, you got nuclear power uh, overflies. You got Tic Tacs. What? What would explain all of that at the same time? I don't know. One last question, somewhat unrelated. Beatles. Yeah. Big yes. time for the Beatles. We share that interest. I, I saw it. some clips. There was something on 60 Minutes last night. Yes. And the footage that Peter Jackson is working with is astounding. <sighs> It's, it is astounding. You're talking about the Let It Be sessions, of course, where uh, they were called Get Back at that the time. It became the Let It Be album. And famously, there was a two-hour documentary made that uh, showed the Beatles just sour and breaking up. But it turns out that Jackson has gone back in, found all this footage, uh, 60 hours of it, and it shows that they still had a pretty good time with each other most of the time. And I think that's lovely. But I will say this, it's, I think the mind-blowing part of it is He's managed to take that footage and bring it to life digitally. And on, uh, you know, it's the cleanest sounding, oh. the best looking stuff. And I will only tell you this, because, you know, I, uh, I wrote a book about the Beatles a few years ago. What if, if they never broke up? It was called Once There Was a Way. And while I was researching that, because basically I took the pivot where in, in our timeline during Get Back, they break up. And in my timeline, they figure out how to keep going. Right. So. I had to study the breakup period to a high degree, which included the get back sessions that Peter Jackson, of course, is now putting on. And I could not find a good copy of Let It Be anywhere. It wasn't on VHS. It wasn't on DVD. I had to buy a copy of D uh, Let It Be off Amazon that somebody in uh, Singapore or something had videoed off a television screen that was the best I could get of it. So am I thrilled about what we're about to see six new hours of this? Yeah. And I wish I was watching it with you because you're right. The, the Beatles is, I, I think the Beatles illustrate something for both of us, George. We both love the UFO world. We've, we've enjoyed the mystery. Uh, we're, we're driven by our curiosity about it, but we didn't check our humanity at the door. 
We still we still have reasons to love things like the Beatles. We still love a good movie that's not about UFOs. We love our families. We love a good restaurant. You know, we're, we're, you're not done being a human being just because you, you you care about solving this giant mystery. So yeah, I love I love the Beatles, and I I'm so excited about what he's done with. Can't wait, Bryce. Thank you. Always great to talk to you. We'll My be in pleasure. touch. Thank Thanks. you. All right. Bye bye.